Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar on Touring Life 101, the nuts and bolts of touring presented by Susan Rose. My name is Laura Lawrence and I'm the Global Marketing Director at Harman. So just a few things before we get started. Everyone on the call is muted to keep down noise levels during the webinar. However, there is a chat function where you can submit questions to the presenter and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible at the end. This webinar is also being recorded and the link will be made available a few days after this presentation. We do have a number of other webinars taking place over the next few months for audio, lighting, video, and control. And we'd like to encourage you to take a look at the different webinars in our Learning Sessions Workshop Series on pro.harman.com, as well as visiting Harman Professional University to see our many on-demand and certification courses that are available to you for free. And now I'd like to introduce you to Susan Rose, the presenter for today's webinar. Susan is a successful lighting designer, director, and programmer, having toured with major artists, including Ringo Starr and his all-star band, Louis Mantel, John Barry, and more. Her self-penned whole hog quick reference guide is an industry standard in console programming instruction. Now I'm gonna pass it over to you, Susan. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Touring 101, the nuts and bolts of touring. Um, today I'm actually gonna talk about things that aren't taught in schools or in textbooks. It's, it's things that us seasoned people have uh, learned along the way. And I just wanted to share it, especially with our younger crowd that, that hasn't toured. You know, most of us on here that have toured are gonna probably relate to 100% of everything that I'm talking about. And feel free to join in if you have anything to add to it or any stories that go along with it. But you don't realize how much you do learn along the way of the do's and don'ts of road life until you start writing it down and you go, wow, that's a lot. So I, I came up with this a few months ago for a session at, a, at another school and thought, you know, this needs to be taught because people just don't know simple things. So let's just start with my first slide that you will get a chuckle out of probably. So I have to work outdoor shows and festivals. You know, I always want to bring like a small umbrella. And in my case, I call it a sumbrella, as you can see in the picture here. It comes in handy for multiple reasons. I got to connect the dots, you know, albino tan going on. So I always bring an umbrella that can double as a sumbrella, as well as sunscreen and some bug spray because we've all been eaten alive by mosquitoes at some of these swampy gigs that we do. Um, I always like to throw a small poncho in my road case because once again, you get these afternoon storms or evening storms that come in, and especially if you don't have a tarp out there that comes out of the blue, you can throw a poncho over your console, but I use it to keep myself dry too. Um, I also bring with me one of those small, like flat backpacks that you can buy, so they fit in your suitcase nice and flat, you know, with little strings on them. So I'm playing tourists or just walking around somewhere, I can throw my water bottle in it, and throw souvenirs because we all know that I like to buy tacky souvenirs um, when I'm walking around. But I usually always bring um, a little backpack too, just for playing tourists or just to, you know, for off days. Of course, power banks for your cell phones and chargers because you don't always have, you know, access to charge your phones when you're out, you know, working or playing tourists during the day. The next thing I want to share is uh, we all know this, that tour on a bus, the people that haven't toured on a bus, this is probably the most important thing you got to know today. No number two on the bus, okay? I think y'all catch my drift on that meme, okay? So if you got to go potty, like really, really bad, tell your bus driver, maybe there's a rest stop they can pull off at, and uh, if not, well, there's this thing, I'm not going to go into detail, called hot bagging it. I think y'all can probably figure out what that means, but be considerate to your bus driver and all of your fellow people on the bus, liquids only, and the toilet. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the cardinal rule of a bus right there. Um, that's probably the first rule I want to share with bus life is number two, okay? So, those that haven't toured know that buses or don't know this, buses are usually really, really cold. Much better than being too hot because when the air conditioning broke down, it sucks. Um, it's really cold. So for me, I'm cold nature and I get cold easily. So I always have sweatpants and a sweatshirt that I wear on the bus because I'd rather have too many layers of clothes and not enough, especially when it's really, really, really cold on there. For my bunk, I also bring extra phone chargers that I'll leave in my bunk. 
because it's better than unplugging it and taking it into the venue, trying to your theater, and then taking it to the hotel and having to drag power cables along. I always set up my whole little bunk with my own um, individual set of chargers for all my GAC, for my headphones and for my phone and my laptop and whatever I'm going to take to bed with me at night. Um, I usually use earphones also. I use personally the Bose um, noise canceling earphones because it cancels out a lot of the road noise, uh, snoring, <laughs> people snore. And also be considerate to your bunk mates because you know, you are sharing a space with with a handful of other people. And nowadays, you know, with, with the internet that's usually provided on the bus and our cell phones, we can listen to music and TV shows and YouTube and Netflix and whatever in our bunks to go to sleep, but you don't want to share it with the whole bus. So be considerate and always have some headphones with you to listen um, if you're going to watch TV in your bunk. Um, I also usually have, like, some bus shoes or flip-flops to wear around the bunk. Different buses and tours have different uh, little rules about where to put your shoes. Um, I would just ask whoever is, you know, your production manager, where the best place to keep your, your shoes that you've worn throughout the day on the bus. Everybody does it different. I've been on different tours. Some put them in the hallway, some put them in a drawer, some put them in the back lounge. You know, I, it's just, I would ask your production manager where to, um, you know, put your shoes. Um, also, you always want to leave your big luggage down below in the bus bays. I usually have a small backpack or my computer bag that I'll bring upstairs with me to the bus. But once again, you're sharing the space with a lot of other people. So you can't just throw your stuff anywhere because that's just that's just rude. <laughs> so um, some tours may have an empty bunk on the bus like ours does just because we're spoiled. And uh, we actually have a couple empty bunks on the bus. So um, we call them junk bunks. So we'll just throw like our computer bags and our little miscellaneous stuff in those bunks. And if there's not bunks available, usually the back lounge or those other areas that are dedicate where everybody can pile their stuff so it's not scattered all over the bus. You know, once again, you know, clean up after yourself, be considerate. If you go into the, the little kitchen on the bus to make something, you know, that's great, but throw your stuff away. Don't leave, you know, cans and drinks laying around or trash laying around because once again, you're like you have a lot of roommates. And you don't want to be cleaning up their mess, but they don't want to clean up yours either. So I always just kind of ask where to store your stuff. You know, we all have our little spaces we go on the bus to work on our laptops and stuff. And um, But when it's time to put them away, you can either put them in your bunk or if you have a junk bunk, you can put it in there. But just be considerate of all the people um, that are around you. Shower time. So there's another one you guys might that haven't toured will want to know about. Bring shower flip flops because I hate to burst your bubble, but you're not going to be showering in the Ritz Carlton every night unless you're the artist. <laughs> um, it's not very glamorous, especially for us girls. I'm sure for the guys too. But sometimes we're in arenas where we're in nasty locker rooms, you know, where hockey players have been and sports people have been. And it's it's oh, it's gross you know, or some dressing room in the back of a theater that hasn't been cleaned in, you know, four years. And um, it's just it's just going to help you not get infections on your feet and get all kinds of just germs and gross stuff. And I even wear my flip-flops or socks in the hotel room because if you think about it, you don't want to think about it. What's on those carpets in there. So I always do bring a pair of what I call shower flip-flops, and I just keep them in my toiletry bag. Um, I also, so I don't have to get in and out of my suitcase every night and go into the bus bay and pull everything out. I do have, I think I mentioned it earlier, a small backpack that I bring with me that has all my shower stuff in it. I usually put my, my sweats in there and my toiletries I'm going to use to shower, my shower gel, um, any shampoo. I also use those um, lupa things because you don't always usually have washcloths unless you bring your own washcloth. You're provided towels in the production office, but that's about it. You grab two towels, and that's it, and you go shower. I hope you have towels by the end of the night when you're the last ones to uh, load out. <laughs> but I usually bring those little scrunchy loop of things with me. That way, at least I have something to put the shower gel on with me. And, of course, my hairbrush and my toothpaste and toothbrush and whatever your essential toiletries are that you need for the night. And then I'll also put a couple days' worth of um, my upcoming clothes in there, my upcoming T-shirts, because the next morning I do it in reverse. I get up. 
and I go get off the bus and go straight in the venue and find a dressing room or a bathroom and go ahead and change clothes and my clothes for the day, you know, brush my teeth, put my hair in a ponytail, and then go back to the bus and throw it on. I can deal with putting my dirty stuff up later in the day when I can get in the bus bay. But it's just convenient just to have a separate little bag with you. So you're not constantly dragging your your big giant suitcase in and out of the venues every night because that can be a pain in the butt, especially in the old theaters where there's not really elevators. You go know, up and down a lot of stairs. So um, I just just uh, suggest bringing a smaller bag or tiny suitcase that you can put on the bus with you with, with your essentials that you need. So luggage. Little things too that have annoyed me over the years with luggage. Um, first of all, when we talk about luggage weight, uh, if you haven't flown a lot, uh, most of us have, but those that haven't, there is a weight limit. And they will charge you when you go over, unless you've got some super elite status. Um, you're over 50 pounds on your luggage. Uh, they'll charge you for it. You're going to be sitting at the gate trying to take stuff off and put clothes on and shove things in other bags. And just be conscious of the weight. I have a little scale that I use at home. So I always want to leave a little extra weight because yours truly likes to buy tacky souvenirs. So I like to have a little extra space <laughs> in my luggage to buy crap. So really think about what you really need to bring. I usually pack about seven days worth of clothes because um, you will be able to do laundry on the road. We'll talk about that later. But I just try to have a couple pairs of shoes that goes with everything, you know, my work clothes and maybe a couple of day off outfits and that's it. You know, just I don't need my entire wardrobe to go on tour. And I definitely don't want to be overweight in my luggage. And overseas, the luggage the luggage weight may vary as well. So it's just best to find out prior, um, you know, what what exactly your your weight limit is. Something as simple as the type of luggage for convenience, especially for somebody tiny like me. Um, when I have a big giant suitcase that's bigger than me, I like to have a handle on the bottom of it. And a lot of the luggage nowadays, they don't put it there anymore. And that's the first thing that I look for when I go to the shop for a luggage. But of course, it's got the handle on the top and on the side. But if you got to think about it, when you're in a hotel room, you're trying to pick up this big out of weight, overweight suitcase to put onto a bench or something. You're trying to pick it up by the wheels or something, and it's just all cocky. And it's very uncomfortable. So I've gotten to where I always look for it. The first thing I do is look for a handle on the bottom of that, that suitcase down by the wheels. If it's not there, I look for another one. Um, shallow pockets, lots of pockets are great because you can you can organize things in your pockets. The deep pockets, think, things tend to get lost in them. And I use a lot of those travel cubes as well. If I could have like my show t-shirts and one and my, my socks and another one. So everything's organized. I'm not constantly rummaging through my suitcase trying to find things. I try to keep things pretty organized in my suitcase just to make it more comfortable and easy to find stuff. Um, I also bring a neck pillow with me. Everybody has their own preference. I like those little, you know, U-shaped uh, neck pillows, uh, especially on airplanes. You know, I put my noise canceling headphones in my neck pillow, and I'm I'm out. I'm passed out on the plane for a while. Um, I also use that on the bus, believe it or not. So it helps to me just kind of keep my neck stable in those bunks because the mattresses are like this deep, and you you have a really hard flat pillow. And um, I always, you know, tend to bring those pillows. I have like a hundred of them now because I forget them half the time. I have to buy new ones in the airport. But anyway, um, and also um, we'll talk about laundry later, but uh, Tide Pods or insert laundry detergent tablet, you know, in your little Ziploc bag. I usually put enough for the tour in there. Don't eat them. Don't eat Tide Pods, okay? Contrary to popular belief, they are not candy. They're for doing your laundry, okay? Fly dates during a bus tour. Sometimes you'll be doing fly dates. Sometimes in the middle of a bus tour. There's been times when um, we've had a long submarine ride, we call them, where it was a two or three day bus ride. And if we have the days off, they'll, sometimes they'll just fly us to the next city so we don't have to ride the bus. You don't want to be dragging all your luggage around there either. And even on a European tour, when you're doing mostly fly dates or you know train dates like in Japan or whatever, I don't necessarily want to be lugging around my giant, you know, 50 pound suitcase everywhere, especially on trains. So once again, I utilize my smaller suitcase for that. What we'll normally do is just leave our uh, suitcase on the bus. Or and if we don't have a bus, if there's room on the truck, we all will just at the end of the night after loadout, just throw our suitcases on the end of the truck 
take our little mini bag we have with us with our clothes for the next couple of days and toiletries and you're on your way. It's a lot more convenient than lugging your all your luggage around, depending on what you need, of course. But um it just makes things a little bit more um convenient. One thing to remember though, if you do do that, and especially if you're overseas, keep your passports with you. Uh, we had an incident a couple years ago when we were on a European tour and our our uh, one of I won't name who, but one of our people by accident uh, threw his passport in a suitcase that went on the truck. And we were in Austria going to Israel and he noticed this on the way to the airport. So he had to stay behind and track down the bus to get his passport to get into Israel. So if you are on a, an international tour, just make sure you, you keep your passport closed. I usually keep mine in my computer bag because I always have my computer with me, um, but never toss it, lock it in your suitcase because if you leave without your suitcase and you don't have a passport, then you're staying where you're at. Laundry day. So don't worry, people. You can do your laundry on the road. Um, Sometimes the, the production will call you on radio in the morning and say a runner is taking your laundry out to what they call, you know, a fluff and fold. And when that happens, you want to have your dedicated laundry bag with your name on it. And usually you just put an envelope in there with $20 and send it off. Go so take it to the production office. They take it off, do your laundry, and they come back with it. Um, they'll put your change in there, and they usually put a receipt, too, if they're a good uh, business. There are other ways to do your laundry too. A lot of these venues have washers and dryers, especially arenas or theaters, a true theater that has a wardrobe department. And most of the time they let you use them, but you gotta remember there's probably only one or two of each. So be considerate um, of your of your um, crewmates. Don't just throw your laundry in and walk away and don't come back till the end of the day. That is not cool. And typically what we've done in the past is we all so we find out there's a laundry machine, we all grab our laundry and go running, you know, to get in there. But you just kind of put your bags in line. And uh, as soon as one bag is done and the person gets it out and puts it in the dryer, the next bag goes in. And I usually set a timer on my phone. So I usually find a window when I know I'm going to have time to sneak away for a minute. Like when we're loading in, I'll go throw it in and then put my timer on. And when my timer goes off, I'll find a, a, a window that I can run put it in the dryer, then I'll be on my radio and say, hey, the washer's open. You know, not everybody gets on the radio and says that, but for the most part, people are, are pretty good about doing that. But I would suggest, you know, just be considerate. Don't hug the washer and dryer, but it can be done. I mean, you're there all day and all night. Even in the afternoon, you can stick it in there when you have a break and just set a timer on your phone and go back and get it. Um, but there are options for doing laundry, so you're not going to be stuck with, you know, dirty laundry the entire tour. Um, so, uh, once again, bring your Tide Pods or uh, laundry detergent pods, whatever, and you'll be good to go. Not every place is going to provide detergent. Sometimes they do, but I just always bring my own. So I'm not using anybody else's. So, international travel. Uh, we've already talked about your passport. Keep your passport with you at all times. Um, like I said, keep it close to you in your computer bag and something you know you're always going to have with you. Even traveling domestically now, we need to have this new driver's license called the Real ID. I just got mine last week and uh, it's effective October 1st, I believe. And without this new Real ID driver's license, you won't even be able to fly domestically unless you have a passport. So if you don't have a passport, um, you can still fly, obviously, domestically, but make sure you get your driver's license updated um, because if not, they're not going to accept a normal driver's license anymore as of October of this year. I sign up for all the perks because I fly so much. The, the line, the security lines are so long, and it is worth it to get TSA pre-check. I got TSA pre-check, and there's actually another program some of the airports have called CLEAR. I got that too. That basically butts you in front of the TSA pre-check people. <laughs> but um, TSA pre, I highly recommend for flying anywhere. If you do a lot of international travel, global entry is also your friend because when you come back into the United States, you're not standing in those long, long lines to get back in. You just go to the machine, put your passport on there, it scans your face, and boom, you're right through. So if you travel a lot, these conveniences are actually worth 
worth having. I and mean, if you travel, you know, once a year like normal people, then don't worry about it. But if you're traveling a lot, which we do when we tour, um, I highly suggest those things to sign up for because uh, it'll save you a lot of time when the security line is long. Also, another thing I want to say I, I didn't put on here is I always try to find my gate too before I go play in the airport. I made the mistake in Europe one time. I didn't realize that after security was an additional passport control line. So I got through security and thought, oh God, I got a couple hours on my flight. So I'm shopping and I'm eating. And I'm just kind of walking around, looking at stuff, keeping myself entertained. Time to go to my gate. I get around the corner and uh-oh, there was a long, long line to get through passport control. Yeah, so we're looking there. So typically in any airport, I don't care how big or small, I once I get to security, I'll go ahead and find my gate and get a visual on it at least. And then I can go play, eat, do whatever until it's time for my flight. That's just a little word of advice because some airports have additional um, places you have to go through. And, and now I'm not sure what it's like flying now. Maybe you guys have some insight into that, but I have the feeling it's gonna be even a longer process now um, flying for a while, because I don't know if they're gonna do taking your temperatures or whatever, but um, I would give yourself plenty of plenty of time in the airport. I'd rather have too much time than not enough. You know, if I get there early, I keep myself entertained. You know, I'll go eat, play on my computer. So I'd rather do that than be stressed out trying to, you know, to get to my gate. Oh, good. Um, power converters and travel adapters, don't wanna forget those. Most of our devices nowadays have um, automatic switching on them. They're good for, you know, 110 to 220. But make sure before you plug into anything that it is, I always carry multiple adapters for different countries and a little converter as well, just in case. But um, I always have on my, I usually have a couple of each adapter too, just in case I need one in my hotel room, or I need one with my lighting console or something out front, I need some adapters. Um, but I usually do try to always carry um, power adapters. Of course, you want ID and credit cards and your passport. I also get a passport card with my passport. I don't think it really costs anything extra. If it did, it wasn't much. But when I'm overseas and go out, I usually leave my driver's license locked up in my laptop bag, which is locked up in my hotel room. And I carry my passport card as my identification. And I carry a copy of my passport with me. Used to, I would scan it and carry a paper copy um but now i actually have it in my phone so i've scanned it and saved it on my phone as well so that way if i do get stuck out somewhere i've at least got some copies of my identification but if i get mugged i'm not getting my passport stolen off of me um, so if i get mugged or i lose my backpack or I get stolen i've still got um multiple copies of my passport on my laptop i've got a paper copy in my computer bag i've got one shoved in my suitcase i just want to make sure it may be a little we're done it, but I'd rather have that than to get mugged or something gets stolen from me and me stuck with no ID. Um, I do always lock my stuff up. I lock my passport in my bag, my computer bag, and then I lock my computer bag up. So it's just better to be safe than sorry nowadays because you never know who's gonna have sticky fingers and um, take things with you. But I do always leave um, important things locked up and when I'm out playing tourist or even out working, I'll have copies on me and um, uh, that way I'm always covered. I put luggage locks on my luggage, my backpacks and my computer bags. So when I walk away, I can at least put a little lock. Anybody can break in if they want to, but I think it deters people, at least if it's locked or somebody just kind of walking by to slide their hand in there real easily to get it. Um, on your luggage, they have the TSA locks. I've lost many a TSA locks because the TSA likes to open them and not put them back on. But at least it, once again, it makes it harder for the people with sticky fingers that just like to unzip and grab and whatever they can out of there. That does happen, um, unfortunately. Um, even in my hotel room or front of house or backstage, if I walk away, I'll, I'll lock things up. I'll put a cable around my box or I'll, I'll put the locks on my on my bags just, to, just for, you know, keep things from throwing legs and walking away. Um, I always leave a form of ID secured in a separate place in my laptop bag or wherever. Like I said, when, in case I lose my main one that's on me. I suggest having two credit cards and here's why. Once again, I'll carry a credit card with me when I'm out playing tourist, but if that gets stolen or lost or something happens to it, 
at least I got an emergency backup back in my hotel room and my computer bag. Um, I always I always do that. I don't carry a lot of cash with me if I do get cash in a local country, because some countries, you know, you go to these little markets with cash only. I typically will, I've learned to use ATM machine there because it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody out there, but um, I found that the exchange services, especially in the airports, will rip you off. And it's actually a cheaper rate to do it through your bank, through an ATM machine. Um, also call your credit cards before you leave and tell them you're traveling, especially overseas. Um, but I actually had mine locked when I was in Kiev, Ukraine, <laughs> and I went to buy dinner, and uh, guess what? They had frozen it because, oh, I'm in the Kiev, Ukraine. Hmm, that's not normal. So um, I always just call in advance and say, hey, I'm getting ready to go to Europe or Japan, or I'm doing this big tour. I'm going to be in 20 countries in the next month, you know, and they usually look at you like you're crazy, but um, you just tell me you work for entertainment. <laughs> but um, the, the credit card companies have really good algorithms these days of tracking and knowing kind of your, your spending pattern. Um, but uh, I would still call them just in case, especially if you're going over. I wouldn't care, worry about them in the United States as much, but when you're going to a lot of different countries all in a short amount of time, it's not a bad idea to tell them. Um, sign up for the frequent flyer programs. Take advantage of that. You know, you are being paid to fly around the world and stay in hotels, so why not collect the points? You know, um, I, I use my airline points all the time to fly for personal, you know, when I'm not touring. So you can sign up for your frequent flyer, give that to your production manager or whoever's booking your travel for your tour. And they'll, they'll typically add those numbers to all of your bookings. So if you fly Delta or American or whoever, um, just give them your number and you'll be accruing those points. Um, same with hotel rewards. Sometimes you'll get the points, sometimes you don't get the points if you're not the one who paid for the hotel room. Um, it depends on how the tour has set that up. I also take advantage of my two credit cards that I do have are actually affiliated with the airlines. Because once again, when I use my Amex, I get Delta miles. And when I use my MasterCard, I get American Airlines miles. So that's just personal preference for me. I like to rack up my miles so I can fly for free on my free time. So safety. So I don't recommend using debit cards, and let me tell you why. My Amex gets stolen, the number itself, at least once a year. It just happened about a month ago, just on the dark web. You know, the numbers get stolen. They don't have to have a physical card. They, uh, recently, I got a, an alert that somebody had charged two charges on Lowe's for a, a, a totaling almost $2,000. And um, so when your credit card gets stolen, at least you can call them right away, and you don't, you're not responsible for those charges. I found, I've seen this happen to so many people where they had a debit card stolen and they get their checking account wiped out, and it takes a while. They'll get it back eventually, but it takes a while for the banks to get it back in. That's just the experience that I've had and I've seen. So I always just recommend people, especially when you're traveling, if you can get a credit card, use the credit card and just pay it off, you know, pay off your um, expenses. I usually put my per diem in the bank and, uh, Get the get the miles, get the points on my credit card, and at the end of the tour, I just use that money to to pay off my charges that I put on the credit card. Um, so I'm really good at paying mine off every month. I have revolving debt, so I'm not saying get yourself in credit card debt. I'm just saying for traveling, um, it's, it's safer than cash. And especially with the pandemic going on right now, they're trying to make a lot of things cashless anyway, as to not spread germs. So um, I would prefer, I, I personally prefer a credit card over a debit card. I don't want my checking account getting cleaned out by some clever hacker that duplicates my number and sells it and, you know, charges up everything. Um, I don't carry large amounts of cash, like I said. Um, I found the local currency is. Like I said, if I need a little of cash, I'll, I'll get it from an ATM machine. And what I've learned how to get rid of it, it's hard to get rid of it at the end of a tour if you haven't um, spent it all or when you're leaving a country, especially all the coins. Overseas, they have all these coins, and I hate all these coins. So normally what I'll do is, like, Maybe the last couple of days that we're there, if we're staying in a hotel, I'll just charge any of my hotel, you know, charges from the restaurant or whatever to my room. And when I go to check out, I give them all my cash and what's left over goes on my credit card. So that's a good way to, to get rid of that money and not have all those coins to bring back to the U.S. and give away as Christmas gifts to your friend's kids or something. And I've done that before too, but um, that's just a, a good way, to, an easy way to get rid of all your your unwanted coins without being stuck with them unless you want to keep them. 
Um, when you're traveling, especially if you're a young female, you know, I always tell people where I'm going. Those of you that follow me on Facebook know that I am truly a misadventure of misadventures, and I am the first one out the door. You know, I don't want to see my, you know, see the world through my hotel room. So I'm always like, bye, I'm going to play tourist. But with that being said, I'm also very aware of my surroundings. Um, I always tell somebody the general area where I'm going that day, I'm going to go on some tour, I'm going to go walk over here, I'm going to be out. I usually give people a good heads up at least the direction I'm going because I don't want to, you know, something happen, especially when I'm not in a familiar place. Um, I use Uber and Lyft a lot. We're all familiar with Uber and Lyft, um, and especially overseas, get some approved taxis um, from the hotel. I recommend them because some there are some parts of the world that are very dangerous and have very dangerous areas that look for tourists. And um, I kind of scream tourists, big T on my head when I travel. So um, they can do bad things to you. So I would always, always just recommend finding Uber or Lyft and they don't have it, just asking the hotel who the reputable taxi companies are. Um, common sense, be aware of your surroundings. Um, I'm always aware um, of people following me. I'll duck into a store if someone's following me. Pickpockets are, are a big thing. You know, you don't think of stuff like this, but like, you know, even your backpacks, people can, in a crowded area can come up behind you and they slip the bottom of your backpack and reach up and grab stuff. So make sure you don't keep anything valuable, you know, in your backpack. If you do, put it in front of you. Usually I'll keep my ID and my money separate and like a little, you know, one of those little thin uh, waistband things. That way they do steal my backpack for not getting my, my phone and my money. <laughs> But, um, but you know, pickpockets, I uh, actually got pickpocketed in Buenos Aires. Um, I was just, once again, not thinking. I had on a pair of cargo shorts and a T-shirt, and I had my cell phone in the pocket on the left. And thank goodness it was tight in there because the cell phone was a little bit bigger, well, almost as big as the pocket, so it was kind of snug anyway. But I was walking down this main this rain road with this big giant flea market that I'm sure a bunch of you have been to where they close off several blocks of streets and all this cool local art and stuff and junk to buy. Of course, I bought it all. Um, but I felt this little tugging on my shorts. And I looked next to me and there's this guy next to me with a like this shoulder bag on. And I just went, I slapped my hand on my phone. I went, no. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if the redhead scared him, but he looked at me like, well, you idiot, your phone's right there. So I immediately went over and bought me a little leather purse thingy and put my phone in it. <laughs> but uh, beware of pickpockets. Um, you, you don't really realize that that does happen, unfortunately. Um, you know, I keep my ID and credit cards in a different place once again, so if it does get stolen. Uh, I have a bad habit to this day of laying my cell phone on the table. I'm eating. We all lay it there. We've all done it. Guess what? That can get stolen really easily that way. Um, when I was in Marseille, France, one time, our producers for the show had gone to dinner and were sitting in an outdoor cafe and they were sitting by some bushes and their iPhone was on the table and all of a sudden a hand came through and snatched it and ran. So, and I was actually sitting in another restaurant there myself by myself and I had my phone out and the waitress actually came over and and motioned for me to put my phone in my lap. And I, I thought it was a cultural thing. And so I realized, oh, she's doing that so it doesn't get stolen. So simple things like that, just be aware, keep your stuff close to you. Um, because, you know, when you're not looking, someone can walk by and, and pick up the phone and off they go. Um, of course, lock your cell phone, put a, whether you're doing a fingerprint sign on or a, a pattern swipe thingy or whatever. Um, that, that way, if somebody gets a hold of your phone, it'd be harder for them to get into it. I got turned on to VPNs last year. I never even knew what that was until last year. And uh, I use Tunnel Bear myself, but I have that on my phone and laptop now too, because it basically puts you on a virtual private network. So when you're in a public place like an airport or a hotel and you're using public Wi Fi, it's very, very easy for people to hack your computer and your phone. So I try to remember to turn that on. I forget a lot, but at least I try sometimes and have it on. But uh, just be around, aware of your surroundings and, uh, you know, especially when you're in an airport um, on your computer, people can get your passwords. Be careful when you're talking on the phone, giving your credit card over the phone, because people can be listening and grabbing that information. So you, you just 
Uh, don't realize what people do these days. Communication. So, a lot of you are not old enough to remember this, and a lot of us are old enough to remember this. There was a day where we had to use these things called pay phones and calling cards. Mm hmm And a foreign country. That made it really, really fun. And you had ALO dial-up, and there was just really not the best of communication, you know, 25 years ago on touring. Nowadays, we've got the Internet. You know, all of our phones work for the most part all over the world. Um, you want to check your data plan. I've heard horror stories of people that are on AT&T or whatever network that doesn't have unlimited data, and they get overseas, and all of a sudden they get a $1,000 cell bill. Um, check your data plan when you travel internationally, for one. Um, personally, the carrier that I have has unlimited data and texting overseas, and so far it's worked in every country I've been in, including China and Israel. And um, my data and texting is free, at least. Um, but there are a lot of useful apps that are common that we use to communicate between um, all of us, especially in overseas. There's, a, there's an app called WhatsApp. And that's very popular overseas. Um, I love WhatsApp. You can video on it. You can do phone calls on it. Um, you can text on it. But of course, it's from one WhatsApp person to another, just like Skype. Um, you know, and then of course, there's FaceTime. Everybody's got down their iPhone, Skype. Um, but I have an Android, so I use WhatsApp myself. Uh, Facebook now has a video chat as well. I think they even have a Zoom feature on. Facebook now for conferencing, but um, Facebook also has a video app for those of us that are on Facebook. You can video chat with people now and talk to people. I'm always sniffing out Wi-Fi. This comes from my cruise ship days a million years ago where we all would jump off the ship and run around and look for free Wi-Fi. You can always find it somewhere. But most, you know, coffee shops and restaurants now have it. You may have to buy something there, but it's a way to find your Wi-Fi. So if you do want to communicate back home without using your cell, data, you can go find Wi-Fi somewhere and just hop on WhatsApp or um, FaceTime or whatever. There's another cool app called Marco Polo, which is like a video texting app. I use that a lot, too. It's a cool way to, to share your experiences with your, your family or your friends. And it's a quick little, hey, our, you got a baby at home. Our, our, our sound guy actually has a baby. And here's what my baby did today. It's, it's actually kind of cute. But Marco Polo is another a cute little app to use. Food. Okay, y'all. Y'all know I like me some chicken wings. But contrary to popular belief, I do eat other foods. Don't tell anybody, okay? But when you're traveling, enjoy the local food. You know, um, I, I love trying the local food in places and not, you know, the chain restaurants. But there are some things you got to be aware of that you might not think about, and I've made these mistakes. You've heard the saying, don't drink the water especially when you go down to South America or some of the foreign countries that don't have the same um, standards that we do, our bodies just aren't used to those bacteria that they have. And it's not just not drinking the water. It's even when you go to catering, be careful of things that have been washed in that same water. Now, if it's cooked, you're fine. But if you're thinking about something raw vegetables or raw fruits or stuff that has been washed in this, this water, that can make you sick, and it didn't make all of us sick on a tour one year. We were in um, the Yucatan, pretty much where the Montezuma's review, where Revenge uh, <laughs> came from, and uh, half of us, crew and band, got it. Don't know how, not sure what we ate, because we're all usually pretty savvy and careful, but um, we it was, it was not a, a fun time. We actually had to cancel a couple of shows from it, but just make sure to think about um, the catering that you have, um, if they have used filtered water, that's great. But some places, if it's questionable, just make sure it's cooked or just just choose your food wisely that day. As far as ice goes, you know, I'm the token American in Europe that always asks for ice for my Diet Coke, my straw, you know, or as Waldo. But um, the ice cubes usually will have a little hole in the middle. That means it's been filtered. Um, some of these countries actually grab the, the ice out of like fish containers where fish, fresh fish come in. And um, you just got to be careful of the ice because, once again, the ice is the contaminated water. So um, just make sure you have filtered ice and uh, drink bottled water if you're not, if you're unsure of anything. I rarely ever drink tap water, especially overseas. 
um, but just drink bottled water because that's typically safe. But enjoy the local food, though. Ask the locals for recommendations. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to try something different. You know, I like to to try the local flavor. So I'm not I'm not chicken wings all the time. I promise. So medications. First of all, nothing illegal. Okay, let me just straighten that out now. Nothing illegal because you don't want to be the one getting caught and shutting your tour down. I don't care how good you hide stuff. Just just be smart, okay, when you bring medications. If you have prescriptions, that's fine, but it's strongly advised to at least have it in the prescription bottle or bring the prescription or the prescription label with you, especially if it's something that um, could be um, interpreted as something bad. Definitely have your prescription with you. I usually have a little travel pharmacy I carry with me, especially when I'm going overseas and don't have access to Walmart or Walgreens. Um, I'll bring like ibuprofen and some Zyrtec, you know, allergy medicine, some Dranamine if I get car sick sometimes, some NyQuil, um, Pepto-Bismol, just a little pharmacy. And if I really am going to uh, like some really foreign country where there's no access to a lot of stuff, I'll get my doctor to write me a prescription also for a Z pack and some Cipro to take with me, just so I'll have it on hand, just in case I do get sick, because getting sick on the road sucks. So, um, you know, if you're here in the United States, it's a lot easier just to send somebody out, run her out to a Walgreens to get you something. Um, probiotics are really good. Probiotics really help your um, digestive system and actually help give you the bacteria you need to fight off some of the bad bacteria, just in case you do eat something bad or contaminated. Taxes. Um, a lot of us are freelance. And when you're freelance, that means we're 1099. And uh, you do have to pay those taxes at the end of the year. So make sure you put enough aside to pay your taxes. Keep all your receipts because it's amazing what you can write off. Um, your tax guy can help you determine that if you have somebody help you with your taxes, which I do just because mine are a mess from having a multitude of 1099s and W-2s all mixed in. So save all your receipts. Um, I personally like to use my credit cards again for all my expenses and pay them off every month because your credit cards help itemize everything for you as well. Makes life a lot easier in the end. Still have your receipts to back them up, but it does make life easier when you are submitting your expenses to your tax guy. Um, playing tourist. Like I said earlier, don't see the world from your hotel room. You know, go out and enjoy the local food and the local flavor and you have your comfort zone of McDonald's, please don't eat McDonald's all over the world. You know, you're getting all these cool countries to try different foods. I personally like to do the hop on, hop off buses if they have it. It's a great speed tour of the city to at least get an overview of the one day that you have off to go see Milan or Rome or wherever you're at. Um, I think I'd make a good tour guide for that, actually. That may be my next career if this doesn't come out of this pandemic pretty soon. But anyway, um, I also use Google Maps. Google Maps is great because you can, I've walked a lot of places with Google Maps, finding where I want to go find, and it just takes you where you want to go. Google Translate also is very helpful um, because it translates things, especially when you're in Japan, you use a little magic looking glass, I call it, or you can use your camera to translate labels. If you can't read the label, you just, it translates it for you. And I also download a currency convert so I can see it through. Health and fitness, yeah, we don't have a lot of time to exercise on the road. Our job is our exercise, but I still try to keep moving. In the afternoons, if I have free time, I walk around the venue, put the music in my, my ears, and just start walking and do some laps. Um, sometimes I bring my rollerblades and rollerblade around the venue, a little skating rink. If there's a hotel gym on my day off, I usually go in there. I just try to stay healthy and um, eat healthy because especially now, we need to really keep our immune system strong. Get as much sleep as you can. I know we don't sleep a lot on these tours, but don't stay up partying all night, especially when you got to do it the next day. You know, just just save that for the days you have days off and you can sleep in. Mental health is very important these days. It's a hard life. We have fun, but it's also very challenging at times. So if if you're going through something, find somebody to confide in. Um, that that's there's, there's hotlines available and. And, you know, if anything, is find a friend to confide in. Nothing is worth your mental health and having a meltdown out there on the road. Legality is disclosed to your employer. If you've had any kind of arrest on your records, trust me, you know, it'll be confidential, but you'll want to disclose that because, once again, you don't want to be the one 
at the Canadian border holding your tour up because you got arrested for something 20 years ago. So just make sure to pull your employer aside and say, hey, yes, I'll let you know before we go in this country, I had this happen a long time ago and whatever happened and they'll get it straightened out however well they can. But just save yourself the embarrassment and just disclose it um, privately. But most importantly, have fun. You know, we have a great job. We work hard, but we play hard. You know, go out there, do your job, put on the best show that you can every single night. Have fun, enjoy the your, your road family. Everybody get along the best you can because those are people you're gonna be living with for a long time. But have fun too. You know, take advantage of the time off that you do have. Even if it's just an afternoon, you know, go see, you're getting paid to travel the world, go see it. Don't just sit in your hotel room. You know, I don't understand that sometimes to each his own, but you know, take advantage of that and go make the most of it and and have fun. So those are some of my tips that I've learned along the years. And if anybody wants to share some stories that I missed or whatever, feel free to join in. All right, perfect. We ha do have some questions. Okay. Um, so the first one says, um, I turned down a tour once because there wasn't a non-smoking ban. Is this a concern on your level of touring, meaning smoking versus non-smoking or even sober versus booze on the bus? I think that's all personal preference of the tour and whatever tour you're on. Um, for us, we have no smoking buses. Um, you know, you can smoke when you get off, of, you know, if there's a rest, when it's stop at the truck stops and the rest stops, that's when if we do have smokers, they would get off the smoke. But for our the tours I've been on, um, our buses have been uh, non-smoking. Um, we haven't had a dedicated smoking bus. We haven't we have enough smokers to to really um, go for that. Uh, as far as drinking, once again, do it in moderation. Don't you know you don't want to be partying and smashed and drunk and hungover coming into your job the next day. Just like a job at home, drink in moderation. You know, most it depends on the tour. I mean, I've always been on tours where we're allowed to drink, have a have a frosty beverage at night before I go to bed, or we want to step and drink for a little while, that's fine. Just use it to your discretion. But smoking is tricky because um, majority of, you know, all the tours I've been on, I've had no, no smoking buses. It doesn't mean you're not allowed to smoke outside the bus or outside your hotel. Cause we do have a couple of smokers on our tour, but they they respect the rest of the non-smokers and just wait until we stop. So um, yeah, there's not really a dedicated smoking bus per se. Now some tours may, I don't know, but the tours I've been on, it's all been across the board, no smoking. And I think the bus companies too don't want um, the buses coming back reeking of, of, of smoke. So just be considerate, be a considerate smoker. You know, we're not telling you not to smoke, um, but if, you're, if, you are, if you do choose a smoke, just do it when they stop, when the bus stops and go outside and get your smoke break in. Okay, the next question is asking, what about having a card of the hotel where you stay? So if the taxi driver doesn't understand you because he doesn't speak English, you can give him the hotel card. Absolutely, good, good, good call, whoever did that. Um, I do that as well. Um, get a business card from the front desk. I, I do that a lot, actually. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll pin it on my Google, but in case my cell phone goes dead, I always have a business card, especially in another country. Um, I actually utilized that in Japan last year. I showed the guy the the car and said, here's where I'm going. So yes, very good point. Yes, absolutely. Okay, next question is asking, do you use any apps such as Google Translate to help you when you're in other countries? Absolutely. I talked about that a few minutes ago. Actually, um, that's very helpful um, because a lot of times, most countries for the most part speak some broken English, but a lot of times it's frustrating trying to communicate. So I'll just type it in my app and show it to them and they type it back to me and show it back to me. Um, it comes in useful too with the camera function on Google, Google Translate because like when you're in Japan where, you know, me, I don't understand that language at all. And I can't read that language. So if I'm in a store trying to buy a, a soda or a water, you know, I can, I can hold our menu in a restaurant. I will hold my camera up to it and translate it and find the key words I'm looking for. So yes, yeah, Google Translate absolutely is so helpful um, overseas in other countries. Okay, I have two questions that are kind of similar, so I'm going to combine these. Um, I've never toured. How can I get on a tour? And where would you recommend applying to get on a tour? 
Um, well, it's word of mouth, but we're even working for companies. Like if you're working for a production company or a lighting company, um, sometimes being in the right place at the right time. Or if you're working in a shop, per se, like you're working for, you know, a lighting company like Bandit or something, and you're working in the shop prepping a tour, that's a good way to get the experience and get in there and show interest that you want a tour, you know, and tell the company you're working for that you want a tour. Um, even if you're just going out as a, you know, part of the part of the road crew, the stage hand, or to repair lights, or you know, just be uh, an assistant. Um, there's there's so many um, avenues that you can get in and, and get in. You know, start going to working local load ins and load outs of tours in your local um, venues, your local arenas, and start getting to know people. Because networking is really really important in this business. It's just you know having your business card ready and and uh, just just getting out there and networking and, and showing the interest that you want to tour. And just being around it and, and telling people, because you never know when a tour is looking for somebody. And there are also online, um, I can't think of right now, there are some online work goals and boards too that post um, touring jobs as well. Kate, as a follow up to that question, what experience or qualifications would you recommend before applying for a tour? I would at least have some kind of show experience. I mean, like I said, whether you're working in a theater or a theme park or a cruise ship or an audio or lighting shop or a company, um, it is definitely to your benefit to have all the experience you can and knowledge, at least in in, in basic show setup. You know, work some load ins and load outs at your local venues and really start learning the ropes of of how concert touring works. And that's a good way, way to learn is just working load ins and load outs. Yeah, you're going to be pushing road cases and pulling cables. But there's a reason that you're pulling that cable from point A to point B and, and putting this case over here and hanging this light here and the speaker here. So I think it's the more experience you can get, the more valuable you are going to be to be hired on a tour. Um, and like I guess the knowing even just these little things that I talked about today, you know, is going to help you going in as well because you're not going to, you know, walk in and it's quite as, oh, how do I tour, you know? But um, I think just working load-ins and load-outs and working as many shows as you can to get the experience um, will make you a lot more valuable and, um, you know, to be hired on a tour. Okay, we have a comment from someone, um, just as a reminder, when you sleep on a bus, to sleep with your feet forward. I'm assuming that's in case you get slammed on the brakes. <laughs> yes, good call. Yes, I, I didn't even think about that one. Yeah, and I, we always sleep with our feet forward, but yeah, because the bus does slam on their brakes, you go up forward. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Yeah, definitely sleep with your feet forward. Um, yeah. There are small bunks too, so if, you, if you're one of those people that rolls a lot in the bed, you know, I, I always like the top bunk personally. So I'm, I'm little, I'm like a little monkey, I just climb up there and nobody wants that one anyway. But a lot of the um, larger, um, especially more built males, like the bottom, you have to climb up as high, but also if you're going to roll out of bed, if you tend to roll off your bed, you get a bottom bunk because you don't want to fall out. It would not be comfortable. <laughs> Okay, we have a question asking if you have any recommended phone apps that are a must for touring other than Translate and Maps. Um, those are the two that I use. Them. Oh, Currency Converter. Um, like I said, it helps if you have a Currency Converter. So if you are getting cash or you want to know how much something's costing, um, I always have my Currency Converter. And then, of course, I always have my, you know, WhatsApp and, you know, communication apps. But I think the Google Translate and, and Google Maps um, are probably my two vital ones as far as just um, definitely have. But yeah, I, I recommend WhatsApp because WhatsApp is used internationally. It, it seems to be great. I got hooked on WhatsApp actually overseas because if I met somebody there, that was a way I can communicate to them without having to use my um, international uh, calling data or anything. I could just call them on WhatsApp for free. So if I was making arrangements with some people to go to dinner or whatever that live like in Italy, we just communicated through WhatsApp. But I, I personally like WhatsApp myself. I'm sure there's other apps out there, but that one's a very popular platform. All right, we have a couple of bus specific questions. Um, what's the best part of the bus to travel in? Front, back, middle? Depends on uh, if you get car sick or not. <laughs> I personally get motion sick. So it's hard for me to even ride in the back lounge because, you know, the back of the, just like I'm being in a car, the back lounge tends to, 
wobble a lot more and I just get a little bit like oil on my curl. Um, so I actually, for me, I like being towards as far front as I can. Even if I'm on an airplane, I try to sit as far forward as I can, at least in the middle or forward. But on a tour bus, I always take the top left driver's bump. I don't know why I've always gone for that one, but I'm comfortable there. I'm as close to the front of that hallway as I can get. So I'm in the middle of the bus, so it's not doing the fishtailing like the back of the bus. So um, it just depends on your preference. I mean, if you don't get car sick, you know, it, it doesn't matter. But if you do tend to get motion sick, I suggest staying as far forward as you can. At least you're not getting that kind of equilibrium offset in the back. All right, the next question is asking, did you have a favorite bus driver and why? Oh, Lord, that's so many. I can't remember all their names. Um, not a favorite person. Oh, gosh, there's a couple. I can't remember the names, though. Um, I've had some great bus drivers where I just sometimes I'll sit in the front seat. I like to see the world go by as I'm driving. So if I can't sleep sometimes or if I'm up early in the morning, a lot of times I'll go ride shotgun with the bus driver and I won't, if they don't want to talk, I won't distract them. Some of them have been chatty and, you know, had good conversations with. I mean, they're people just like us. They've been amazing, you know, but um, as far as who my favorite one is, I can't really recall offhand. Okay, the next question is asking, do you keep a wrench and other production tools on you at all times, just in the theater or not at all? Typically, when I'm touring, I'll have that in my work case. Um, you always want to carry, you know, your wrench with you for tightening lights, um, some basic tool set with you. Um, for me, particular on Ringo, I'm not fixing the lights. Um, I've got a, a master electrician with me that fixes it when it breaks. So, like, for instance, I'm working on a show right now here in town. I was just telling you guys earlier, one of our theaters is reopening up next week, and I'm actually in there this week doing something that's not my job. I'm helping the house LD rehang the entire rig. And I was climbing around a catwalk earlier today. So yes, I need a wrench. <laughs> and then I need wire strippers. Um, but definitely, yeah, definitely have a wrench, a Leatherman, our insert multi-tool name. That's just the brand name of it. It's a Leatherman, a multi-tool, which is good to have. Um, but yeah, I, I typically do have a basic set of tools with me to do just simple things, little screwdrivers. Like your multi-tool will have that in it, you know. But yeah. Definitely have you have you that stuff on you. Okay, next question is asking, how do you prep yourself when traveling to a country with a huge time difference? Going back real quick to the other question, if you're traveling with tools, put them on your luggage because you can't take them through security. So sorry, I, I just happened to think that you don't want to go through security with a knife that you love and they're gonna take it from you. Um, so what was the question again? Um, how do you prep yourself when traveling to a country with a huge time difference? I actually have a sleeping problem anyway, and I am like a freak of nature. I, I adapt pretty quickly to time differences. Um, I think the best thing to do is, I don't think about it. Like, it, it's easier for me going on tour than coming home. Usually when I come home is when it hits me. But I think when I'm going somewhere, like if I'm going to Japan, that's what, 12, 12 or 13 hours ahead. Um, Sometimes we'll stagger our, our dates getting there, but if we don't, um, you usually jump right into it. Sometimes they'll give you a day to kind of adjust, but I usually just jump right in and don't even think about it, you know, and because your adrenaline's going and, you, and you're just doing your job and you might get a little tired, but you just, you just got to have to, you learn over time how to retrain your brain um, to kind of just adapt because you have no other choice. If you have a load in, you know, 8 a.m. is 8 a.m. doesn't matter what part of the world you're in. So it may be hard at first, especially if you're not used to it. You may be really tired at first or awake at 3 in the morning going, whoa, I'm wide awake right now, you know. Um, it usually takes a few days to really have your body um, think. Uh, but coming home for me is the hardest, especially uh, coming from Japan or somewhere like that. Because usually when I get home, my adrenaline has been going so much the whole tour. I've been go, 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 go nonstop. And the minute I get home and stop, it's like your cell phone battery going dead. It's like, now we're going to bed at four o'clock in the afternoon. So it just, everybody's different in how they adapt to um, time differences. You know, I always laugh when people complain about daylight savings time and one hour difference and how their whole day is just, oh my God, it's so screwed up. And I'm like, 
that's just Thursday for me, one hour. <laughs> but that, mm -hmm. that the shorter trips don't even phase me anymore. Um, go overseas, we'll take you, cut your body a few days to adapt, but you just got to mentally just not even think about it, or you're going to make yourself more tired if you dwell on the fact that, oh, my God, I'm loading in now. I should be going to bed. And your body's going to get, you know, you just got to keep moving and let your body just sort of naturally sink. It's not easy, but like I said, I've been doing it for so long. It's just, it's gotten easier over the years. But at first, it, it can be a little tricky, but um, just keep moving. That's my best suggestion. Keep moving until you, you've got to program your body. So if you know you've got to work, you can't go to bed till, let's just say, you make a day off, 9 o'clock that night. If you're wide awake, make yourself go to bed because you've got to start getting your body used to um, the time when you're going to bed, the time you're getting up. So it's kind of a little reprogramming you have to do on your body, too. Okay, the next thing is uh, another tip from one of the attendees. They said, um, wash shampoo bars for showering, hand washing clothes in hotel, and this way there's no bottles of plastic that can leak. And I want to add to that and say when I travel overseas, I always pack several different sizes of um, Ziploc bags. That way if I do need to put anything that's leaking into it or dirty shoes, um, they always come in handy. Very good point, yes. Yes, very yeah. good tip. So another question, um, what was the best tour you have been on and why? Well, I've loved them all, but I may be a little biased. Um, of course, Ringo, you know, I've been with him as his lighting director for 18 years now. Uh, we unfortunately canceled our tour this summer, <laughs> but hopefully we'll go again next year. But he, it's just a fun tour. It just so happens that we have a great combination of people on that tour. Um, we're all like family. I'm the little redheaded stepchild, no pun intended. I'm the little sister on the tour. You know, they all tease me and pick on me, but when it comes down to it, they're very protective of me too. They may threaten to sell me in South America and leave me in Russia sometime, but when it comes down to it, um, they they have my back if, if someone were trying to hurt me. And uh, we all just get along. We all respect each other's space. We respect each other's lives and personal lives and spouses and girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever anybody has. It's, it's just, we're a big family. And even the band and Ringo are just the most amazing artists I've ever worked with because, you know, they've been there, done that. They've had this, their big heydays and now they're out there to have fun and they treat us all so well. It's not like we're not allowed to look at them. We're not allowed to speak to them. It's just it's just fun. It's hard work. And some venues, as, as we all know out there, can be very challenging. And you, But even a bad day out there is still a good day compared to a lot of people's days. And we have our bad days out there. And, and you know, venues that are trying to put 10 pounds of crap in a five-pound bag and have to alter our rigs and have it, you know, fly space this high above your head. And there are a lot of challenges that make the day stressful. But in the end, it's worth it because you're working with people that you enjoy being around. So I will say that, you know, Ringo by far is my favorite that I, favorite thing I've ever done, actually. All right. The next question is asking about security. Um, you talked about getting robbed and mugged. How often does this happen when touring? Well, I mean, if you're smart, I mean, not smart, but if you're you're aware, it, you, you slim your chances down. Um, don't don't be afraid. You know, I, I don't mean to tell you that to scare you. I'm just trying to make you aware that could happen anywhere. It could happen here. It could happen here in Tennessee. It could happen anywhere in the world. Um, but particularly for me, especially since so I do stick out like a sore thumb in other countries, especially when I open my mouth and don't have their accent, um, I miss a target for being a tourist. And it's just about being smart. And some countries actually have signs posted, uh, beware pickpockets. They're not out to kill you or murder you. I mean, that can happen anywhere, but um, a lot of people just rely on stealing and it's just being smart. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to go out at all. Just be aware. I mean, our, our one of the tours we were on, one of our um, higher up members on the tour, uh, the band always stays in a separate hotel from us. They stay like in the Ritz Carlton's and Four Seasons and stuff. And they were in a very um, lush area of Buenos Aires, again, where I got pickpocketed. <laughs> But he was walking down the street by himself in front of like a Cartier and Tiffany's and all these expensive places. And these motorcycle bandits pulled up to him. He had his Rolex on. And literally within less than a minute, 
they one guy jumped off the bike and pushed him down, had that watch off him and back and gone. You know, so it's just it's just being aware of your surroundings no matter where you're at. That's just unfortunately the world that we live in. And don't be afraid to go out. You know, I mean I go out all the time and I'm five foot two, little bit thing going out there just going, Wee, we take pictures. But I'm also very aware when I get approached by people and especially if you're in a crowded area, just be careful. Keep your your personal space of course, that's not happening right now, but when that does happen again, just keep your items close. Just keep an eye on it that you don't get pickpocketed. If you have loose stuff in your pocket, that can easily be pulled out. You know, sometimes they'll ask you what time it is or they'll ask you something about your phone and then you pull it out, they'll snatch it. But that, that doesn't happen that often. It, it happens, but it's not like it's happening every minute of the day, every hour of the day. In the, all my years of touring, the only time I ever got almost pickpocketed with that one. So it's not like it's happening every time I go out somewhere. It's just being being aware of your surroundings. But it's not like it's happening every minute. Just just be smart. Don't go into dark alleyways if you are in a foreign place um, that you're not used to being in. Stay in the more busy areas. If you want to go explore the local area, that's great. But I always ask the hotel if it's safe. And But with any any place in the world, you know, just, just be aware of your surroundings. All right, perfect. So up on the screen right now, in case you didn't see it, is Susan Rose's contact information. So if you have additional questions, it sounds like she's open to you reaching out and sending her questions. Um, Susan, thank you so much for the presentation. As always, it's a pleasure having you on and, and working with us on these webinars. Um, oh, I'm loving it. It's great seeing you guys. Thank you guys for joining me today. Um, before we sign off, I just wanted to throw a couple of links into the chat box for everybody. These are links that we um, often get requested. So the first one is a link to our Harmon Professional University where you can access all of our different curriculum that we offer and it's all for free. Um, and then the second link is our playlist that's out on YouTube. So this webinar that you're on right now will be out there after we're done recording it. Um, and all of the other sessions that we've recorded are out there on that playlist as well. And then the third link is to our events calendar for all of our upcoming sessions. So if there's you know, anything that you haven't signed up for yet that you're interested in or you want to see the full listing of what's coming up, that link that's in the chat box right now, um, that'll get you there. So thank you so much for attending, everyone. We really appreciate your time. Thanks again, Susan. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Good seeing you today. Bye. Thanks, Fred. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.